is 128, um, which is here. By the way, CCDC should have happened over the weekend. I didn't hear any reports of how it went. Anyway, hopefully it happened. Um, all right, so we're here. There. Uh, they're going to talk about the first part of Chapter 3. There's one more chapter after this, one more half of this chapter, and that's the last class. That's the end of it. And then the final exam. So there are two more classes, and then the, uh, we'll just have the final exam available online. So let's take a look at this. All right. So attacking iOS apps, what we're going to talk about today is transport security, insecure storage, and patching it with Hopper, which is a hands-on project I used to have. I don't have it anymore in this class, but I may be able to add it next time. We'll see. Um, and next time, there's a few more things to talk about in the internals of iOS. So here's some attack scenarios. If you want to attack your phone from the network, then you could... Um, trick the server into handling out tainted data if you find a way to hack into the server or you find something like a cross-site scripting vulnerability on the server that lets you bounce attacks off the server. Um, of course, there's physical access to the phone. Just steal the phone, plug in a cable, feed in data. And then there's interactive access where you have con uh, dynamic control. You have a shell on the phone. You can now execute commands. You manage to get to install something like a malicious app with a Metasploit shell or something like that. So transport security, we talked about. Um, in the old days, a lot of apps used HTTP, which is never safe. There's no way you can make sure you're talking to the right server. People can, in the middle, just add code to it, and you don't know that's happening. So this is never safe because you can add code to it and shouldn't be used for any purpose anymore. Um, and you can just use Wireshark or Burp to intercept that traffic or, or side examine it and just see what's going on. All right, and that's now... Almost everything is now using encrypted traffic. Now, SSL is the old system that is now deprecated in all of its versions, and everything should now be using TLS. And so there are three um, implementations to load data from the Internet in iOS apps. The URL loading system, the Carbon Framework, and the API, Secure Transport API. And this is the highest level, and this is the lowest level. So the URL loading system is the one normal applications would use that has a high-level method like make a URL connection, create a URL session, this is the sort of thing. And it, remember, if you've taken the malware analysis class, it's exactly the same in Windows. There's an HTTP library that does things like download a file from the Internet, and that's what a normal developer would use. You normally do not want to worry about the details packet by packet. But there are lower levels. There's a carbon framework level, which you have more greater control over the network requests, so you can do that. And then the lowest level is the API which in the, in the higher levels are using the negative API, which I think is essentially raw sockets from the description of it, more complex to implement, rarely used directly. You know, this is, this is an option on every operating system to use raw sockets, but it's a whole lot of work, and normally you don't want to. You just want to get an internet connection and do something like download a file all with one command. Um, so you, if you use SSL or TLS, then there's a certificate that's supposed to be validated by a certificate authority, and it gives you a public key encryption you can use to make sure you're talking to the right server. That's the idea. So when it works, this presents eavesdropping and tampering. It means nobody can read your mail, your traffic, and nobody can tamper with your traffic. The problem is the validation might not be as strong as it should be. You have to be signed by a trusted certificate authority. You can add other certificate authorities to the phone and tell it to trust them. That's one way to do it. Or you can accept things that are self-signed, not verified by a certificate, or not signed by a proper certificate authority. If you do that, then, of course, uh, that undermines the whole system. Now, a man in the middle called a privileged position can intercept traffic, give you a false certificate, so your, brow your app will encrypt the data, but encrypt it with the wrong key so the attacker can decrypt it. And now they can intercept, read, and modify traffic. So... Uh, if a developer can choose to do this by customizing this method, receive authentication challenge, if they do that, they can make their application accept self-signed certificates. Uh, then the Carbon Framework, you can also tell it to accept them by uh, setting up a dictionary that sets this value validate certificate chain to false. So it is, it is available to developers to accept unsigned certificates. And I remember I had quite a back and forth one time with a developer 
of a app that scraped Amazon to find cheap prices on Amazon, and he didn't validate the certificate. And I told him, and he said, yes, I just added that feature. Isn't it great? And I was like, what are you talking about? He said, well, a lot of people used to have trouble with the app. It would just have to go a blank page because of those certificate errors. And I found out how to get rid of those certificate error messages that were irritating my users. And I'm like, dude, you can't just turn off this feature and not tell me. He goes, sure I can. It works better this way. And I'm like, dude, you can't do this. Went back a bunch of times. I don't know if he ever fixed it. But in his point of view, all this certificate validation was just an irritation to his users and turning it off was like making his app run faster and better and everything. You could say that. Anyway, um, and what we what's that? It's what we did to the lab to make it faster. It's what, oh sure, it'll make it faster. Sure, make it more reliable too. For you, if all you care about is functionality, getting rid of security is always going to make it easier. Don't bother logging. You know, all security measures always get in the way and slow you down. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. Anyway, um, so the Secure Transport API also has a way to disable the certificate validation. So you can have an app that dis disables any of these. Another thing, of course, is you can add extra things to it, like certificate pinning. So even if the operating system has been compromised, your app still won't accept an invalid certificate. So the app designer does have the ability to make the certificate verification weaker or stronger. All right, so here's various things that can go wrong. Self-signed certificates are not signed by any certificate authority at all ones that have expired, ones that are signed, but they do not have the correct host name, so they're from the wrong site. Um, ones that go to expired root CA certificates, and ones that just allow any root certificate. These are various things that can happen. So you can do dynamic testing. If you're out your traffic through the BERT proxy, we've been through this, you'll get errors. Your connection to this site is not secure. Um, that's, of course, uh, what's happening, because BERT does the man-in-the-middle attack with a fake certificate, and your browser ought to complain. All right, uh, this was an amazing flaw from 2014 called the GoToFail. Um, Apple patched this, and it is pretty hilarious because this is the actual source code in the Apple OS. They had if, what you're checking for an error of the certificate, and if something happens, then go to fail, and then they have an extra go to fail here. So this is if this condition is true, go here, and if the condition is false, go here. So it would accept every certificate. Now, a Microsoft, by the way, did the same thing in IE3. Internet Explorer 3, if you have a certificate signed, it's signed by like one certificate authority, and they're signed by another intermediate, and they're signed by a root. And they would only verify one step up. So you could make an intermediate CA, sign your own certificate, and they would not notice that you're not really signed by anybody higher. So it amounted to about this kind of thing. Um, so this is in some languages that are No, I don't think it meant, no, I think this is C. So the indentation is just for, for the human to look at. I don't think the indentation matters. But the, yeah, in Python it matters. But this, it is, but I don't think this is Python. I think this is C. But anyway, the point is, you have if, go to fail, it's, it's C because it's a semicolon. And then the next statement is what it will do if this if does not happen. Whether it happens or not, it will then proceed to the next statement. Which is, so it's always going to go to fail, so it's never going to verify. So the result of this was it would accept every certificate. Python does not have the semicolons. No, there's an option. Oh, you can put them there. You don't have to. Yeah, yeah, you're right. But I'm pretty sure this was uh, C, although you're right. Anyway, anyway so, um, or C sharp or whatever it is that yeah, Apple uses. The guy probably, probably you know, get confused. Yeah, yeah. So anyway, that's the two go-to-fail lines in a row. So that means signature validation will never fail. So that's pretty rude. Um, all right, and there's other, other errors too. For example, um, uh, you could be using the wrong version of TLS if you're using the low-level frameworks. The high-level framework will not let you modify the session properties. So um, if you're using these, you can modify the protocol version all the way back to the old obsolete ones, SSL version 2 and 3, and those have been deprecated for years. They're both too insecure to be recommended for any purpose. And so you can choose them if you want to. You can choose old versions of TLS even. Now we're up to TLS 1.3, and the earlier versions of TLS are less secure. So um, those are options. These ones allow negotiation, so it will be possible for the exchange to negotiate. And here's various vulnerable versions. All right. When your book was written, they recommended TLS 1.2. Now people would probably even recommend 1.3, but 1.2 is pretty good too. All right, and remember, if you don't know about it, this is how negotiation works. An SSL handshake is a seven-step process. First, you have a three-step process to make a SIN-SIN-ACK-ACK. 
Gmail opens the port to 443. Then you send a client hello, and this is what the client hello looks like. Your client lists all these encryption techniques it supports. And then the server chooses the best one of these. But if you tell them, I am IE2, I only speak really, really old broken encryption, then the server could either say, well, I'm not talking to you, hang up, you cannot see me, or it'll agree to use some really old lame encryption. And that's one of the many ways to have a downgrade attack, where you pretend to be really old, and the server has to settle for something awful. Um, anyway, so you can also specify a specific, yeah? Is that common for servers to support such low Yes, it's very common for servers to support low encryption levels because either the server is really old and haven't updated their software in a while, or the, the, the company wants to talk to people with really old devices, like old phones, old machines running Windows 98, Windows 95 in foreign countries. You know, if you update your stuff, then you lose a bunch of customers. So the question is, who, do you really think you're going to sell your product to people with old, weak computers? Of which there's an awful lot. I can just say there's an awful lot in this country. I have a lot of students using horrible old pieces of junk yeah. that have been handed down. Yeah. And uh, so, you know, there's even in America, there's a bunch of people using old, broken stuff. <laughs> and so it's a business decision, you know. Yeah, it's a good question. Anyway, um, and what's even worse, by the way, is export grade encryption, which is, was required by the U.S. government um, until, I think, 2004 or so maybe 2010, we had to, you could not export high grade encryption. There's special stuff. Microsoft had special K and N versions of Microsoft of Windows that had to be sold to other nations. So they could only speak incredibly weak encryption, like 40 bits encryption. And therefore, they, nobody in the whole nations could see your website unless you could downgrade to there. That's why it poisoned the cryptographic system sort of permanently. That's why the uh, cryptographers hate it when you make force anybody to use weak encryption. This is, like I see, and I don't, I don't like people in China getting no lockdowns and no vaccine. That's bad for all of us for exactly the same reason, because we're all sharing one world, and now you've got a population doing something really bad that's going to spread. Anyway, um, so you can also you developer can specify a specific version if you want to of something like here's SSL RSA with RC4 and MD5, both of which are long deprecated algorithms that shouldn't be being used anymore. But they're still available in old devices, and you can choose to put them in your app if you want to. Um, all right, so anyway, you can intercept encrypted communications. Um, yeah, if you want to test your app and your encryption is proper, then you would have to install the BERP certificate on the phone and tell it to trust BERP. Um, so and if your app has certificate pinning, then it knows some extra fact about the certificate, like its serial number or the key or the name of the trusted certificate authority or something like that, and therefore it will refuse to accept another certificate even if it passes the other tests. And that would also have to be bypassed if you want to view the network traffic with an interceptor like Burp. And there are a bunch of things that do that. Here's a black box tool that disables certificate validation, including certificate pinning, and here's another one. And these are substrate teaks. These are like Frida. These are things that change system messages underneath the app to try to stop the most common methods of doing this. So you don't really need to decompile the app. And it's pretty awesome. I didn't give you hands-on project with it because it turned out to be incredibly painful. It depends on your version of phone, on your version of iOS. You have to have a Mac. And it just was really hopeless to get a class full of students. The only way it would be practical is if I could buy a bunch of phones and Macs and put them in the lab, make everybody go to the lab and use just those machines to do it. And uh, haven't been able to set that up yet. But I mean, having people do it at home on their own stuff was just misery. Um, anyway, so. Local storage, one thing I spent a lot of time reporting this to people and nobody cares, especially on the iPhone, I decided it really doesn't matter because the protection, but anyway, you can store data in your app. And then you ask, when could the attacker steal data? Well, if they could steal your phone while it's unlocked, then they can totally get at everything, just like you can. So that's bad, but normally that doesn't happen because your phone locks in like 30 seconds for no use. Now, if they can get past the touch ID sensor somehow, then they can get in. If they can exploit it somehow, if, they, if you can guess the credentials, or if you've jailbroken your phone, then they might have just left the password of Alpine on it or something, or a default. If maybe there's no passcode at all, or you can pair with a malicious computer or exploit the boot chain. If you can do any of these things, they can actually get through the login process on your phone, and then they can steal all the local data stored by your apps. But it's not that common that you can get through these things. So um, if you store your, something in plain text from an app, um, that's one way that's considered a poor practice. 
or using custom encryption with an insecure key, which is what I find most apps actually do, um, or you store with the wrong data protection class, just sloppiness, where it's not encrypted like it should be, or inadvertently stored by iOS, I certainly find a lot of this on Android, that the operating system has stored something in like a cache, which the developer didn't think about. Um, so there is, in fact, a plain text copy of something sensitive like a password in there. Remember the API, we talked about this. You have the passcode, which combines with the UID code to make the passcode key, and so certain things are encrypted this way. There's various um, encryption keys, but here's the protection none which your book describes as unencrypted, although from this diagram, I think it's somewhat encrypted, but not in a way that protects it very much. Anyway, there's different levels of encryption. No protection, complete until first authentication, and so on. There are other options. So if you want to find out what data protection class is in use, if you can back it up, then there's a program you can use to analyze the backup to decide what data protection levels the various pieces of data have. Um, you can go to, if you want to find out how your keychain items are protected. You can use keychain dump and then look for protection class inside there. This one is protected when unlocked. Um, I think most things are when unlocked. I've had a student sneak up and use to my Mac in class and dump out all my passwords from the keychain. So, um, of course, it makes sense because I can fill in stuff for the password, so it's there. Um, all right, then uh, you can do dynamic analysis using Cydia Substrate. Again, you can instrument it, change the methods underneath, and modify this. There used to be a tool called Snoopit, but it doesn't seem to have been maintained. It doesn't work anymore, which happens to most free iOS and OS X apps. They change it vigorously every time, and the free stuff is usually not updated enough to work on the modern versions. Um, it's too much work to keep up with it, and only people that are making money can pay enough developers to actually keep up with the rapid changes. So anyway, if you get an iOS application, which you can get off your phone and then decrypt in ways we talked about last time, you can get a binary with dump IPA, uh, which is like the um, APK tool we used for Android. And then you can use um, this dump something called ringdoll.ems. Some app starts the target app, and then uh, it dumps it. So you end up getting a dump of the decrypted app, and then you can disassemble it with Hopper. And what you'll see when you disassemble it is ARM assembly code. Um, well, this actually looks like, uh, this looks like I Intel assembly code, which sort of confuses me. Are there iPhones with Intel processors? That doesn't sound right. Yeah, anyway, uh, this is one I actually did. I was an iPhone 6 when I did it. This looks, no, I'm, that does not look like ARM assembly code. Anyway, um, so I'm not quite sure what's going on with that. Um, anyway, and then you can, here's jailbreak detection, where this, this just shows some kind of, uh, this is the ARM assembly code. That's, def, that's what ARM assembly code looks like. Everything is always using these registers, and they're like 16 registers. Um, so this is ARM assembly code doing stuff, and the way you can tell what it's doing is by reading the message that says, this device is jailbroken. Please remove the jailbreak and try again. So here's the messages it'll print out under different conditions. So that's the jailbreak detection, and so you could, modify this code and make the app run despite the jailbreak detection. So we could do that kind of project if we had could overcome the hardware problems, which yeah, I have so not been able to. Does this thing go to what? You get this uh, code to the, the tool dump something that Yeah, yeah, through that dump program, yeah. And it's the process we talked about. There are, there are programs, dump IPA. Dump IPA will pull it from the phone and decrypt it. That's as I remember. Actually, you just give it here, and it's going to um, you can see what it does. It dumps it from the phone, starts the dump, and uh, then it does, I think it creates the unencrypted version. Yeah, from a specific phone. All right, and so here, by the way, you can get pseudocode out of Hopper. Hopper will disassemble, just like Ghidra, and turn it into pseudocode. And so here it is writing the pseudocode version. It's going to print out this message, security violation message. Um, not a whole lot read more readable than the assembly, though. Which is why, like I was saying in the news, there's now this AI chatbot that will take pseudocode like this and write a paragraph in English explaining what it does, which really would be very helpful. So I think um, AI helping programmers is really coming out fast. And pretty soon we're all going to be using AI code. Have you seen the chat GTP thing? Yeah. There are people saying, you can give it a thing like write an assembly code program to do this and it will write the assembly code. And then you can say, turn this assembly code into C code and it'll do it. And the latest thing, the guy put a patch in IDA, they'll say, take this 
automatically generate a disassembly and write a paragraph explaining what it does, and it will do it. It's crazy. Like, the other yeah. day I, was, I spent like an hour trying to fix some bug. I put it in there. I said, what's wrong with this? And I fixed it for me. <laughs> I know. I think, I think AI helping programmers is coming in a hurry. Yeah, so I mean, it'll be good at first, and then there'll be all sorts of malicious evil uses for it. Probably. Like, well, one thing they say is you can totally improve your spam messages. Write a thing in good English, and that, but I'm sure there'll be a million more evil things to do with it. Yeah, that's true. The, the, the machine code there, the previous time? Yeah. You, uh, those messages, uh, the, 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 um, what are the, the, the register or something? Yeah, this one here, this is the assembly code. Here's the raw hex. That next one was pseudocode, so it's sort of a decompiled into sort of C, but not very accurate C. No wonder those, those messages, they put out the, how they kept it. Did it just read the, the code and then put it somewhere or something? Uh, these messages? The next, next this, okay, this next one is pseudocode, so it's just an attempt. Well, this one is ARM assembly code. Yeah, oh, these messages here. Right, these messages, the Ida Pro does the same thing. It puts comments here to sort of describe. But, but Ida Pro doesn't put, like, uh, this form is a, a jailbreak, you know, that kind of messages. No, but that, it, it didn't write that. That's just, the, this, that's just what this value points to, this PC. It just, this is just a stored string. Yeah, it didn't read, it did not understand it. It's just showing you this is a point of true text it can read. So it probably, uh, Well, I think this one was just labeled PC. Oh, yeah, I, maybe, it, maybe it's a debugger. You're a good point. Uh, uh, Hopper is a debugger. It's a debugger with the ability to generate pseudocode. So and that's what I used for this. And Hopper is quite powerful like Gidra. All right. So let's take a look at a Kahoot, which I should have down here. I do. Good. Which is 128.3a. All right. Yeah, a hopper is the tool used for that, and it's really pretty nice. But it's just garbage. Play with up to 50 people. Classic, Classic mode, I guess. Yeah. I hate people. Every keep changing everything. Everybody in, everybody in tech keeps changing stuff. Every day it's like, what is this garbage they put on top of things? That's why this is the whole reason that AOL existed. They would, uh, they would just not change things. Because <laughs> people that are busy tend to get like this, you know, I don't care what, about this new thing, just shut up and give me the usual thing I need right now. <laughs> oh, well, they've messed up the music. Not too bad. I think they've got a new music option. What's that? Oh, it's not the same, but, but some of them are really pretty miserable. This is reasonable. Better than uh, better than most chip tune kind of stuff, you know. Alright. Alright, so what scenario? Might put malware in the app store. The interactive scenario. You basically get a shell, you can execute interactive commands. All right, which implementation is the most common? loading is the high level one that a normal developer would use. These detailed ones are too much bother for most purposes. Framework? Carpet framework is something in between the URL and the low level raw sockets. I don't really understand why there's three, but there are. 
So you install BERT, but you still can't intercept network traffic. What's wrong? This happened to all of you, I think. Yep, that's the problem. If you're using certificate pinning, then it will refuse to connect through BERT. It'll say the certificate is no good, I'm not talking to it. All right, how do you get user data from a stolen locked phone? Okay, bypassing the touch center is the only way that's going to do it. If you try many passcodes, it won't work because it'll only try like 10 and then it'll destroy the data. And jailbreaks like CheckRain will not do it. I've had this argument with the developers of CheckRain, like I say, one of the developers was in my class. And I said, he said, all it, all it will do in the jailbreak is let you in the OS, but it will not get you in where the user data is. And I said, couldn't you do that? And he said, maybe we could, but we do not want to create that tool. The jailbreak community is not interested in becoming the phone theft community and they won't write that tool. So um, there is not a public jailbreak that gets you to use your data. All it does is get you into the OS so you can research the OS. So wouldn't you need a passcode to even install the jailbreak anyway? No, that's what, that's what they figured out how to bypass that. Normally you would, yes. They figured out how to bypass the boot process so that you can install an alien OS, which is by defeating Apple security. And the special thing about CheckRain is it's in the boot ROM so Apple can't patch it. All the others only work for a week or two until Apple patches it. But this one will work forever if you get a phone of a certain version. And it's fairly recent. Like, I think it's up to the 14, and I think CheckRain works on like 9 through 11 or something. 9 through 12, something like that. So it's mo fairly modern phones you can use. So all you have to do is buy one of them, and now you can research the OS, which is why the jailbreaking community loves it. Right. That's a real name, Luca, I think. Indeed, that's a real name. Oh, good. Oh, 